On today's episode of The Resilience Project, I speak to Bella Collins, who without any previous experience in rowing or endurance events, broke three world records as part of an all-female team, rowing across both the Atlantic and mid-Pacific oceans, and in one case, beating the previous world record held by four days, which had been held previously by an all-male team. Having always been seen as a bit of a geek when growing up, Bella shares many resilience insights that can be applied to everyday life, from how she overcame doubters, including herself, plus the mental strength she had to find during hugely dangerous conditions whilst out at sea, and shares her leadership lessons from learning how to survive for so long in an enclosed space with three others. Her expeditions have earned her global recognition on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list, and she shares some great lessons. Welcome to this episode of The Resilience Project, chatting with Bella Collins. You've got an incredible story, but an unlikely one, because I think you describe yourself as maybe the school nerd, someone that was used to getting A's, but wasn't necessarily used to being very sporty. And then before the age of 30, you've had three world records. So how did that even come about? It's a really good question. And I still ask myself that today because I still, I still struggle with um, the fear of saying yes to things or fearing change. Um, I still suffer from, uh, you know, lack of self-esteem. And I think, really all humans do it we all have elements of our lives or our personalities where we struggle or don't have the confidence in ourselves um but I think what I've managed to do over the last 10 years is lean in more to the courage and lean in more to my support network than focusing on the fear of things and so and I think I especially learned that after my first row which was okay, actually, if, I, if I'd leaned into the fear at the beginning, I would never have said yes in the first place. But actually, because I, I leant into the courage, oh my God, I, I went and broke two world records and rode across an ocean. So actually, let's, let's remember that forevermore. And every time I've had an opportunity put on my path, uh, I've said, okay, let's just say yes and see where it, where it leads me. So yeah, I think it's acknowledging, okay, I am fearful, that is scary, but hey, let's give it a go because I've already proven what you can do once you put your mind to something. And so your, what age were you when you had your first record? I get, I, you know, I lose track of time. I was 21 or 22. I think I was 21 when I said yes to the Atlantic and 22 when I completed it. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's, that was the rowing from La Gomera to Antigua in the, Canary, in, uh, in the Caribbean. Amazing. And, and so were the times you can remember earlier where you perhaps let fear beat you and said no, that you then kind of regretted that led you to this point? When I was at school, I was, I, my brother's nicknamed me Lisa Simpson. I was uh, sort of the um, hashtag nerd alert type girl, like girl who I studied really hard. I worked really hard for my exams um, and I was okay at sport, but I wasn't like the most practical or I wasn't the most ambitious. Um, I couldn't throw a ball, I couldn't catch a ball. You know, I definitely wasn't a sporty one. And in, in, in my siblings, my brother was the adventurer. He was, he wanted to be Bear grills. He wanted to go and live with tribes across the world. And I had the expectation in my head that I was probably gonna go to a really good university and climb the ranks in London. Um, but definitely at that time when I was trying to decide if I wanted to go to university or not, something in me said, well, what's the other path? You know, if you did go to university, you know what that path looks like, but what would, a different path looked like and so I didn't go to university um I said let's just go to London and if I need to go to university and get a degree because I find a job I want to do that needs it let's do that then so I think mm -hmm. there's always been something in my gut that has led me down the sort of the other route the other option um but I, throughout all of that I have lacked this uh confidence in my ability and I definitely lacked a sense of purpose when I was 20 I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life I didn't zero ambitions really um other than the just ex expectation that I would climb the ranks and so yeah it was it was a funny time of my life and one that I sort of look back on I'm like god who was that girl at the age of 20 because I don't think I had any idea who I was or yeah. what I wanted to do yeah and that's that's actually immensely brave especially when you did do well at school and you were you know as you say the nerd 
it would be easy to fall into university. I, I, I went to a school as well that pushed everyone into university and I didn't really want to do it. Uh, and it's very brave to, to be that person that says, actually, I'm going to pick a different route. Do you think there was something in you from earlier in your teens or, or even younger that, that pushed that to be your route? Definitely. I think um, I think I was probably brought up like that by my parents and I was really lucky. My mum always took a lesser trodden path as well. So she left home, I think, at the age of 16 and didn't re return home for 16 years. She was traveling the world. She became a scuba diving teacher um, and she did things very, very differently. And I think maybe what she's taught me in life was to not be scared of taking the different route um, and just listen to your gut a little bit. Um, mm. So I think I probably had a bit of that growing up and um I always just think well what's the worst that could happen because you can always yeah. go back to university you know there's a couple of times I relocated in my 20s and like was a bit scary moving to that place but I can always go back to where I came from so I think I've always again thought okay well what's the worst that can happen I know where I can return back to if it doesn't work that will be a very inspiring message I think particularly for younger people uh who whether they have or haven't gone through uni who can mm. perhaps look at that and, as you say, what's the worst? You, you can always go back to it. Do you think as you get older, uh, I'm not trying to age you here, I'm not trying to put you into my ridiculous age, but as you get older, do you think that might change? Maybe, you know, if you get, uh, you know, end up with kids or a house, you know, big house or whatever, and mortgages, do you think that might change? Or how do you think you could keep yourself on that path? Yeah, definitely. I'm already feeling that, you know, I live uh, in my flat that I bought alone and I'm paying the mortgage by myself and I've got a dog that I look after by myself and it's really scary. <laughs> and I just got asked to row across another ocean and there's a huge part of me that said, no, you've got too many responsibilities. Who's going to look after your dog for three months? Who's going to pay the bills because no one's going to pay you whilst you're going to be on, on an ocean? Um, but I again just said, do you know what? These have been big hurdles you've gone over in the past these things do tend to work themselves out. So just believe in yourself that you're gonna find a solution, say yes and figure it out along the way. Um, don't let that op opportunity pass you by just because you don't know the answers just yet. And I still don't know the answers. I, you know, I'm hoping my boyfriend might you know, say, I'll oh, look after your dog for three months who um, who's recently, he's recently come into my life, but so it'll be a big ask on him. Um, but I, I think the answer is, Yes, there is a lot more things you have to take into consideration as you get older. There's a lot more people that are relying or animals that are relying on you. Um, but again, mm. if you do it with a support network, actually, there's, there tends to be a solution for everything. So don't de don't let those things uh, stop you from maybe trying new things or yeah, reaching for your dreams. So tell us about the first um, the first trip. Then how, how did that how did that come about? What was that like? How long how long were you out for? Yeah, so I, um, at the age of 21, came across the path of a woman called Lauren Morton, and she was on Bear Grylls the Island, one of those very um, early series where Bear Grylls put a load of people on an island to survive. And um, so that I kind of knew of her through that. And um, she had attempted to row across the Atlantic Ocean in a pair uh, the previous year and spent, I think, 96 days at sea trying to get across it and failed and got picked up by a tanker and taken up to Canada. So she returned home and was like, I'm going to row across this ocean. I'm going to complete it. Um, and that's when I, I crossed paths with her. And she said, would you like to row across the ocean with me? Um, and I definitely was like, no, that's not my remit. Like, that's what my family does. But I've come from a family of other ocean rowers. So I was like, OK, that, no, that's what that's what they do. That's what the boys do. I don't have the skill set or the mindset to do it. But something was niggling in me saying, why not? why can't you do it? Why is that something that just your brothers or your uncle does? Like, actually, why don't you see if you can do it? And so I, I reached back out to Lauren a couple of weeks later and I said, you know, this has been on my mind. I think I think I want to join you. Um, and she said, great, you're in. And it, it was just as quick as that, essentially. And I was like, oh my God, what have I, what have I done? Um, and I remember talking to my family about it and they were like, oh, are you sure? I remember my dad being like, are you going to survive this? Like he was more worried about me rowing across an ocean than my brother rowing an ocean because for some reason they all thought, you know, Angus was more capable than me. Um, but I think that spurred me on even more to prove them all wrong. Like, okay, well, no one really thinks that I should be doing this. I'm just going to show them I can. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that 
we left, uh, we did a year's campaign. We raised a lot of money to get to the start line. Our team was called Row Like a Girl. So it was four women. And we were raising money for Plan International, so trying to raise money for uh, female rights. Um, and uh, it was an, yeah, an amazing campaign. And we left in December 2015. And it took us uh, 40 days. Um, so we came second out of a race of 26 teams uh, and broke two world records. Um, yeah, it was an amazing journey. So 40 days. And how many of you on the boat? Four women. And, and what did you say the name of the, the team was? Row like a girl. Row like a girl, right. So how big is the boat? I mean, like, that must have been tough in itself. Yeah, so the boat's 28 foot long, five foot wide. And it kind of looks like an egg, to be honest. So you've got two cabins on either end and then a deck in the middle. So you can sleep two people in each end. And on the boat is everything you can possibly need. So you're fully unsupported. Um, so all your food is on board the boat. You have a desalination machine, which turns seawater into drinking water, all your medical equipment, your navigation equipment, all your clothes. I mean, you name it, it is squeezed onto that boat and everyone knows where exactly everything is down to like the raisin in your sack pack type thing. Like, you know where everything is on this tiny boat. And you are rowing two hours on, two hours off the entire way across. So 24 seven, two hours on, two hours off. That's amazing. Two hours on, two hours off. So sleeping isn't really a thing. Like napping is a thing, maybe. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons for the two hours on, two hours off is that um, a normal um, sleep cycle is about an hour and a half. So that two hours gives you enough to have a full sleep cycle. Also, two hours on is you can't really row well or at any strength for more than two hours so that's a reason why that pattern has been adopted by most people that row across oceans there are some adaptions depending on how many people you've got in your team or what the weather's doing but general rule of thumb two hours on two hours off and yeah your body just gets used to it you're hugely sleep deprived and that affects your decision making and and your sort of a whole emotional state but you yeah. you prepare for that and um yeah your body does actually weirdly get used to it quite quickly Wow. So when your um, when your shift is over for two hours and then you go to the cabin, can you go straight to sleep or are you then still adrenaline from the last two hours or worrying about the movement or what? Honestly, every shift differs. You know, there's some shifts that you're so tired and you're so desperate to get to sleep because you know you've only got an hour and a half and your mind is just whizzing. You know, it might be from a conversation you've had or a task you know you've got to do on your next shift or something and your mind just doesn't and it's so frustrating you just want to tear your hair out and then there are other shifts you just you literally crawl from your own like your own seat into your cabin and you just pass out I think the one thing that's really important when rowing though is that um you have to keep your body as clean as possible because anything that gets infected at sea can become a real big health issue so one thing you always right. do before you go to sleep is get a wet wipe out uh, we have three wet wipes per person per shift so it's all accounted for. Um, and you clean your whole body and you get every bit of sea salt off you, take all your clothes off, fall asleep, so that when you wake up, you're, you know, you're nice and clean and ready to go back onto your, your shift again. But yeah, it's a um it's an amazing process what you you have to get yourself into. Amazing. That is amazing. Because like being on the boat, being being there for that long, and not as you say, not being able to get off and living with all the you know having to clean yourself every couple of hours and worrying about infection and blah blah like that in itself is a resilience thing isn't it like just sticking in there and not wanting to jump off or phone for a pizza or whatever oh yeah honestly i always crave a coca-cola i'm like why did i not bring a coca-cola with me you know when you're drinking lukewarm water from the desalination machine or you want a cold coca-cola um but yeah, the resilience things, it is the biggest um, skill set you probably need when you're going to row across an ocean. Um, and there are multiple ways that you go about training for that or um, making sure that you are resilient, not just as an individual, but also as a team. Um, and the Atlantic crossing, I think we were naturally quite resilient as a team. And we had an amazing skipper in Lauren who helped direct that. Uh, for my Pacific team, we did a lot of exercises to make sure that we were resilient as a team and that we, we would get on and we would support each other. Um, so there's a lot that goes into becoming resilient and there's a lot of lessons that 
we did within those teams that I now put into like a business situation or within my personal life. Can you share some examples? Yeah, I think one of them is um, culture. I think your culture can, 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 can dictate how resilient you are as a team. So on my first crossing, um, it was a real fun culture. Uh, we were quite young, we were quite naive. We didn't really know what we were getting ourselves in for other than Lauren. Um, and she made sure that we were always having a good time. So we had milestones in place. Um, and when we hit them, we would bring out some gold leotards that we had hidden in the, in the cabin and we'd have like a glitter party or um, we had a spa day. Um, or we just, if a really bad situation came along, we would address it like, okay, well, this is just a situation that's come along, like our, our rudder broke, for example, what are we gonna do about it? And because we had this fun culture, it meant that everything's quite lighthearted and quite easy and that we were very supportive of each other. Um, and that therefore we were resilient to when those issues did come along. Um, similarly mm. on the Pacific, um, we had so many, um, so many issues, especially getting to the start line. Um, but what exercise that we did there to build a, a kindness culture where we really understood each other's habits, uh, our non-negotiables, the way that we like to be spoken to when we're stressed, um, how we act when we're stressed. So we did a lot of conversations around who we were as people that meant that when we were in stressful situations, we could support each other better and create this real kindness culture. And that again meant that when tough situations came along, we knew how to support each other and therefore we were resilient enough to get through them. That would have been some years on from the first one. So you were maybe all a bit older by then? Yes, yeah, so the Pacific Crossing was a different team. Um, so three, three yeah. more women. And I did that in 2021. Yeah, so I was, I think, 28. Yeah. And so what, what did you learn about people? What did you learn about being around people for that length of time in such a small space? Yeah, you learn a lot about people. Um, and the biggest thing that I've learned is nobody's perfect. Don't put expectations on people to be perfect. Um, thrive for consistency over, over that perfection. Um, so, for example, mm. on both of our crossings, we went for consistency in rowing, not, you know, killing yourself in every shift. And because of that, actually, very few people, people ever miss a shift because they know they just, they just show up on time, put some energy through the oars, have a positive mentality about it, um, and you can then, you know, keep up that, uh, it's sustainable to keep that up. Uh, if you expect everyone to pull, pull on the oars 100% on every single shift, you're going to find that people are going to get exhausted, they're going to lose their temper, um, their bodies are going to give in, and actually they're likely going to have to miss the shift to re recover from that. So it's that real consistency in, in the way that you perform. Um, but back to that perfection bit is also that everyone has uh, skill sets that they should be proud of, and everyone has downfalls as well and actually you've got to be forgiving of them um and equally looking at yourself be forgiving of yourself understand that mm. you are not a perfect human being um there's a lot of things that i do that i'm sure frustrate your teammates but if you talk about them and you acknowledge them and you work you find ways to work around them and get them to, to almost complement each other too um then actually you're gonna you're gonna be a much better team because of it so yeah understand that people aren't perfect um learn what their good and bad traits are um, and you're, yeah, you're going to be much better, a better team because of it. Yeah, I think that's interesting. It's a big lesson there, actually, because there is a lot of pressure. I, I don't know if you'd agree on probably everybody, but maybe younger people to look incredible all the time, to look right, to wear the right clothes, to drive the right car. You know, the, the, it, maybe it's a social media thing. And you know, anxiety is going through the roof for people. Mental health is a challenge. And clearly people know they're not living up to that because who is? So do you think there's lessons from that that, that you that come across? Big time. I mean, I am the best example of a perfectionist. I put so much pressure on myself and taking me back to school. You know, I studied so hard at school because I thought I had to be perfect. And so I did, you know, I worked just beyond belief and I exhausted myself. Um, and I still do that now. You know, I've recently gone freelance and I've taken on way too many projects. Um, and I feel really guilty when I let people down or if I don't deliver the very best piece of work I can possibly deliver. So even though I've learned all these amazing lessons across the oceans and saying you don't need to be perfect doesn't mean I don't actually um, still try and do that myself. And so I have to sometimes sit down and say, Bella, your best is enough. 
don't try and mm. you know don't beat yourself up when you're not delivering 100 percent all the time because it's not possible and actually people don't expect that of you either the only person that's expecting that of you is myself so give yourself mm. a break take an hour out go walk the dog but i do have to remind myself that of that all the time and i think to the other people out there that are feeling that pressure um realize that probably that pressure is coming from themselves um and just to sit down and give yourself a break yeah yeah that's fair and, and so your 2021 um uh, your 2021 row was across the pacific uh and that also you also went into the record books for that and that that was a different team i think you were called the ocean sheroes weren't you yeah yeah so that was a different team yeah we called the ocean sheroes and that was rowing from san francisco to hawaii so it's the mid pacific it's 2700 miles so the atlantic was 3000 miles so similar in distance um and yeah we did that in 2021 so just coming out of lockdown actually and that was really hard because we couldn't even get into America at the time. And the, the US had closed its borders to anybody from Europe. Yeah. So that was one of those hurdles. You're like, well, how are we going to how are we going to handle this one? Um, but there were, there were always solutions, like I said, and we uh, we found that you could go via the Caribbean. So we spent two weeks in, in the Caribbean on the way to San Francisco to allow us to get into the country. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we broke a world record. We were the fastest female four uh, to do that. We broke the record by 14 days. Yeah. So San Francisco to Hawaii, 35 days, 15 hours and 32 minutes, I believe. Thank you. I mean, even I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that is incredible. I mean, you must have seen some kind of brutal conditions and some gusts of winds and waves that, were you used to that? Like, had you experienced that in the training or, or did you remember it from the previous time? Yeah, I mean, nothing can prepare you for the seas that are in the middle of the ocean when you're training, you know, um, off the coast of the UK. Um, mm. So, yeah, it was it was still daunting. And on the Atlantic, we had a hurricane, actually. It was the first hurricane to hit the mid-Atlantic at, at that time of year in 80 years. You're not meant to have a, a hurricane uh, at that point. Um, but weirdly, I didn't find the hurricane on the Atlantic that scary. I don't know why... Um, Again, maybe it was a bit naivety. Maybe it was the the fun attitude we had on that <laughs> boat. I found the hurricane more frustrating because we were locked into our cabins for three days. So there weren't really yeah. many conditions out in the Atlantic that really put... They were scary, but I was never scared for my life. Whereas the Pacific, we had on day five a storm come through and the waves were enormous. I mean, I imagine there were something like 20-foot uh, waves, sort of two-story buildings coming up behind the boat. And at first wow. we were rowing them, you know, we were kind of surfing them and it was really fun. Um, it did break our dagger board, mm. which is sort of the thing that keeps the boat balanced, but they were fun and I was, I was loving it. And that's why I get a thrill uh, until, it, until it got dark and you couldn't see the directions that the waves were coming from. And that puts you at risk of, you know, essentially spinning on the waves and capsizing, which is one of the worst uh, sort of situations you can find yourself on or in. So we put out essentially a sea anchor, which is a really big parachute we put out underneath the water and it acts like a, a, an anchor underneath the boat. Um, and we locked ourselves into the cabin for that night. Um, P, my uh, cabin partner, she'd been really seasick, so she could barely get her head off the pillow at that point, um, was not really copus mentis. And the walkie talkies I had to, what, to communicate with the other cabin was broken so I felt I felt extremely lonely that night I felt really scared I could hear the sound of the waves crashing on the deck and I could hear the pull on the rope uh, on the line that our sea anchor was tied to um and I genuinely was scared for my life and I was sort of sending my sort of love up to mum and dad from this boat saying sort of I love your parents type thing um but P came around and I was holding her hand I just said to P I'm, I'm I am absolutely terrified um, and she just said, do you, do you trust the boat? I was like, yeah, I trust the boat. She said, do you trust that the knots you've tied are the right knots? I said, yeah, me, Mary and Lily did that together. I trust them. She goes, well, we're just going to hold hands essentially and we'll be, we'll be okay. Just, just have faith in that trust. And, you know, the sun came up and um, we, we were fine. And, and, and weirdly, two days later, the sea was like pancake flat, you know, just the flattest thing I've ever seen. And mother nature is amazing. How can it go from that extreme you know, weather system that was trying to break us to this just most beautiful, serene sea that you'd ever seen. Um, and actually now sitting in hindsight, what a privilege it was to be in those conditions and to see Mother Nature, you know, at her best and worst. One of the news reports I saw about this actually said that the, the winds were up to nearly 50 miles per hour. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, were crazy. That I, I just don't know how fathomable that is for most people. The idea of you being locked in a little cabin with someone that isn't feeling well anyway, no ability to communicate with the people who are near you, especially when we're so used to having our phone and we can just WhatsApp and text and stuff like that. That must take a lot of inner strength, inner resilience and stuff to get through through that. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Um, and I, I don't think that level of resilience you can prepare for in a way. Um, I think that that comes in the moment. You know, it's that sort of life or death situation that you can't really prepare for. Um, but all you can do is be as strong as you can be in that moment and really lean on that hope. Um, and I think mm. the hope for me was always that time will pass. Time doesn't stop. Time will move forward. Um, and even when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel right now, there will be one um, and the sun will always rise. Um, and I actually have a tattoo on my arm to remind me of that, that I am strong. I've got sort of two waves, which is the Atlantic and the Pacific, to remind me what I've done. And the symbol of the sun above it to remind me that, you know, time does move forward and the sun mm. does come up and there's always hope. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's what I lean on in those tough moments. That's an amazing way to think about it. Something else I gleaned from one of the press reports was that uh, since um, that particular row, since that launched in 2014, only 22 teams have actually completed that Great Pacific race. Don't know if you knew that. Yeah. Um, mm. And only two four-person all-female teams had reached the finish line, um, which is yeah, pretty incredible. Right, yeah. <laughs> and to put that in perspective, though, 4,000 people have climbed Everest. Uh, 1,600 or so have wintered in the South Pole and 566 people have been to space. So yeah, it, yeah. it does put in perspective quite how incredible that challenge is uh, to get through. In fact, you're, yeah, and you're sitting here now I'm and you're a dog. I mean... Yeah, it is weird. It is, it's almost like an alter ego, um, to be honest, because when I do my day-to-day -day life, I'm just me, Bella and my dog and, you know, <laughs> enjoying my life in Cornwall and then there's this alter ego that does these crazy things and at, we've just signed up to do the uh, Indian Ocean of which I believe only uh what's the numbers I think it's like only five women have ever rode across the Indian Ocean more men have walked on the moon um so yeah the next one's even more uncharted territories which uh, is scary <laughs> Oh, hello. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Look, it's just a quick favour. If you're enjoying this, which I guess you are if you're still listening, can you make sure you leave a review? That's all. Now, back to the podcast. Tell me, um, you talked about the fact that your pair, your, your dad and your brother or who, people were saying, are you sure about this? And, and I think for any entrepreneur or anyone who's on, on a different path, they will be quite used to that. They'll be quite used to having friends or family challenge. Are you sure about this? Maybe you even had it recently when you 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 left a you know a job for going freelance. But what what is it in you that 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 says no 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 no? Thanks for your advice, but I'm taking this path anyway because I, I think that's a message that people need to understand mm -hmm. for themselves so that they can beat that. Um, you know, kind of uh, questioning as well. Yeah, I think that comes down to um, a little bit of self-belief, which again, I know we all struggle with, and I've already talked about how I struggle with that, but leaning into that courage and saying, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward. And that comes from a place of passion. And I always think that passion wins. Um, so you read a lot of stories, or I've listened to a lot of podcasts about from founders who have succeeded. And yes, they don't all succeed, a huge amount fail, but passion can get you a very, very long way. Um, so really dig into that and, and understand what are those drivers within that passion that are pushing you forward so you don't lose sight of them because you know, life throws all sorts of things at you or you sort of uh, can slightly lose your way. So really understand what those passion and drivers are for you um, and, mm. uh, and hang on to them because that's the bit that keeps you saying, okay, I'm going to stick, I'm going to stick to my plan. Um, I think the other mm. thing is there are always, there are always supporters. There are always people, there are the naysayers or the people that don't believe you can do it, but go find the people that believe you can, because they are out there, whether that is in your family, your friends, 
old colleagues or it might be a brand new network you know if you're a founder and you've got no one around you who believes in what you go you can do well there's a lot of founders that are in the same shoes so go find those founder networks um because mm. actually there's an, an amazing amount of support out there i'm a big fan of linkedin yeah, um yeah. you know recently going freelance i've been sharing a little bit more with linkedin and there's an amazing community out there that's helping me carve my new career forward so yeah there are people out there so go find them yeah, I think that that's a really good point. I, I, there will be people, particularly, at, well, maybe at any age, but who are on some kind of journey, who maybe don't have that support network close to them, and and they might hear you say that and think, yeah, but but I don't have that. My my parents don't back me, or my partner does, or whoever. But as you say, even if it's whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, there will be groups of people that are doing what you are doing, and if you arrive there and tell them. I'm on the journey too. what advice have you got? You're going to get support. You're not going to get people going, well, you can't do that. You could never do that because that's not how they're wired. They're doing it themselves. Yeah. And I lo- I'm a big fan of community. Um, it's one of the reasons why I actually love the UK. I lived in California for a bit um, and I felt I didn't feel the community passion as much over there as I did here in the UK. I think people like to help people. Um, and moving to Cornwall a couple of years ago, a place that I'd, I'd never even been to before I moved here, um, the community down here is absolutely amazing from the village that I live in to um, the sort of the Chamber of Commerce network where they throw these amazing breakfasts and you go and you just network and meet new people and business people down here are always saying, how can I help you? What can I do? What contacts can I connect you with? And so it is people find those types of situations scary. So again, it's leading into that courage that okay, actually most people going to network events, and most people joining new communities are probably scared too. So don't think that you're the only one. So lean into that courage, take a big like, you know, leap of faith, go find that community and introduce yourself because you'll find a lot of kindness within them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. Is there any is there any moment that stands out and you may not want to name the person, but is there anyone who was close to you that you really expected to support you, who 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 kind of maybe didn't back you? And how did you overcome that? I've had people in my life who love me a lot who say, are you sure you should be doing this? Is this right for your professional career? Um, why are you doing it again? I get that a lot with the oceans. You know, you've done one. You don't need to prove to anybody else what you're capable of. You know, is it really necessary? Um, or a lot of people say, you're already stressed enough. Why are you trying to make yourself, you know, why are you trying to add more to your plate? Why don't you just enjoy your life and make it a little bit more simple? Um, and I know they're doing that from a place of love because they see uh, the amount of stress I can put myself under by taking on these things. Um, so I, I, I just remember that, you know, it's coming from a place of love, it's coming from a place of care and I don't agree with them and I will continue to push myself to new heights because that's in my nature. Um, but sometimes I do listen to them as well because they do love me and sometimes I say, actually, maybe you are all right, maybe today I don't need to go to do that gym session or maybe today I don't need to take on that job because it is one step too far. So I think it is a balance. I think if, yeah, if people are in your life who love you a lot are telling you things, don't always listen to them, do listen to your gut, but every now and then know that it's coming from a place of love and maybe maybe you need to listen to it a little, a little bit. <laughs> you talked about, um, I, you haven't used the words, but I, I feel like you were referring to kind of imposter syndrome uh, a little bit where you were, you know, could I really be this person? Um, is that something you feel you've you, you've come through, you've overcome, or you still have? I definitely felt imposter syndrome after the Atlantic. I felt like a lot of people were putting me up on a pedestal that I didn't deserve to be on. Um, I yes, I rode across the Atlantic. You can't deny that I pulled the oars, but did I really show up? Did I really perform for the team? What else could I have done? Did I learn enough? Did I? Was I practical enough? It was a more basically. I was questioning for years and years and years. Did I do enough? Did I deserve that um, that recognition that everyone was giving me? And I think that was probably my biggest um, thing that pushed me into doing another ocean. Um, and that that also comes from a place of that lack of self esteem and that not believing in myself either. So they they came together. And I think the the learning is is a journey. We're always on a journey and lean into that growth. Um, I'm always trying to grow and understand why don't I believe in myself? What can I do to believe in myself? Um, and for me that I need a lot of validation. I'm not you know, ashamed to say it. I need the people patting me on the back and telling me well done because I don't do it enough to myself. So I have to go get it externally. And that's probably the thing I'm now working on is saying, well, like stop trying to get it externally, try and give it to yourself. 
Um, and I'm, I'm still working mm. on that. And that's the, probably the next part of my growth journey that I'm on now. Um, so yeah, that sort of mm. imposter syndrome has definitely, definitely been there. Um, and it probably is still here a little bit now. Um, and yeah, hopefully I'll, I'll keep getting better at it and believing that I am worthy of what people say and, and the pedestal that people put me on. Yeah. And so do you think that might be why you're, you're, you're going to go again? <laughs> you're going to do it again? <laughs> I think the third ocean is less so because I do believe that I'm capable of um, uh, big um, endurance events. I know I'm capable of it. I know I have the right mindset for it. This next crossing is more for me out of uh, fascination around how people and teams work. Um, so the first team was sort of a naivety and it was led by Lauren. The second team, we did a, a load of work around how we, we were going to perform as a team. And I learned a lot from that. And from both of those, I'd love to now implement that into a third team and almost like test the theories, see if it works, understand how every team is different. And I, I would, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the dy dynamics in this new team do work out. And so for me, it's that fascination piece around teamwork and people. I think the other reason why I'm doing this next row is again on that people theme, I love meeting new people. And when you yeah. uh, take on something like rowing, rowing across an ocean, you're not just learning, you're not just meeting your you know, direct team, takes more than four people to row across an ocean you meet so many wonderful people from media crews to race organizers to um when you rock up at the start line the local community get behind you and they you know welcome you into their houses and you get an insight into their world so you just you just meet amazing people that help you um widen your vision on life and get new opinions and um help you grow as a person so i love i love that side of stuff and when you rock up at the start line as you put it has the has there been a split second where you're like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Or are you just ready to go? Have you have you got past that point? No, you are. You're like, oh my god, why am I doing this? And you're sort of doing the big countdown to leaving, where you know you're going to row away from land, and land slowly disappears, and the quickest way to see land again is to row for days, for yeah. days. So um, yeah, that is it is so daunting. It's so scary, um, and you do sort of question what's going to happen out there am I going to be okay and my teammates going to be okay um and I think because you've rode an ocean before you do have it you do know what's coming and that that's almost worse than not knowing um mm -hmm. but you just take it a day at a time at that point like right, what can I do today that's within my control to make sure that we're as well prepared as we can be to leave uh, I love a list, so I will write about a thousand lists and I will assign them to the right people and uh, probably get a bit more controlling of the things I can control um, rather than sort of being scared of what's happening, like happening in a few days time. appreciate you sharing this so openly uh, and, and, and these feelings, because I, I think uh, it's very easy for people, particularly people who might not be going through their their finest hours. Uh, to look at others, whether it be on social media or people they see on the news or, or, or um, success stories like yourself and think, oh, well, it's easy for them. That, that, you know, everything's going right for them. Everything's going wrong for me. Uh, they were just made that way. I'm not made to succeed or I'm, you know, I'm a failure and all those things. They have those conversations. And when people like yourself and some of the other guests that, that um, you know, I've had the pleasure of speaking to are so open about, you have those feelings too. You have that those self uh, esteem issue or imposter syndrome or why am I doing this and, and all that kind of stuff. It's extremely reassuring for people to realize the gap isn't that far from where, where you are right now, which is maybe where you don't want to be, to where you want to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the first time I went in the rowing boat, I went backwards. I didn't even know which like, way to pull the oars. So um, anything <laughs> is possible, you know, even if you're like, well, I don't even know where to start with that sport or that job or uh, moving to that new location. We'll just just start, just take a step because there's a lot of people that don't know where to start. So um, yeah, just 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 say yes. Understand that it's not going to be a perfect journey. Understand that yes, it's probably very like daunting what's ahead of you, but also understand that it's probably going to be hugely rewarding um, when you're looking back at what you have managed to achieve. Um, so yeah, I think it's sharing that that sort of thought of everyone's probably scared of change everyone's scared of saying yes to things um but actually just be be that person that's going to say yes and see where it takes you yeah yeah do, do you think there's um 
Do you think there's an element though for some people that they are they fear success? They think they're not set up for it, so they don't want to embark upon it just in case it fails. I don't yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Um and I guess that's bit maybe the bit that makes me slightly unrelatable is that I've always strived for success. I've always tried to um maybe it's like competitive nature in me. Um I'm always striving to do better, be better. Um, and I do think maybe some people don't have that. And sometimes I envy them. You know, sometimes I'm like, I wish that maybe I wasn't always striving to uh, achieve the next level. And that is totally okay. Like, there's a lot of people out there at the moment are saying, you know, all these self-help things. It's like, actually, do you know what? If you're just if you're just happy and content, acknowledge that and be really happy and content in that, you know? Uh, because there's a lot of out, people out there that are always constantly striving to be better. And maybe you know, we're actually looking back and saying, well, maybe the grass is greener on the other side. So I think it's about understanding what's right for you. Don't feel that you should be wanting to do more because lots of other people are. Actually, if you are just happy where you are, be happy where you are. Um, you know, it's, I think it's different mm. for everybody. Do you think that as people come out of lockdown, that that maybe their attitudes have changed to that, that, that maybe they've realised that you can work yourself into the ground and you can aim for status or this or that or whatever else, but actually, sometimes there are a lot of other pleasures uh, that, that, that you can take from life rather than just always being on that treadmill. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people this, this summer in particular, in, in sort of within my friendship group, it's been so busy and so hectic that people are, are burning out. They're so busy, they're tired. And that sort of looking back to those lockdown years with almost sort of envy and saying, wow, it was hard, but God, wasn't it easy? You know, it was a bit slower. Um, we could actually enjoy the finer things in life, whether it was cooking a nice meal or reading a book or exploring your local area because you're forced to explore your local area um and I think that a lot of people are starting to realize that and saying okay well how can I take some of those lessons that I had back in in lockdown and implement them into life now so yeah I think I think there is people looking back on it um and saying yeah let's let's slow slow things down a little bit what, what would you say you learned from that period that you didn't already know from being isolated on a boat <laughs> anyway I learned in that period well I got made unemployed uh just before lockdown hit well I, I was I was going to quit my job so I'd handed in my notice and then I was meant to work it out for a few months and then COVID hit and so I got made unemployed instead and so I found myself living at home um at the age of, of 27 I think unemployed living with my parents and I was like oh my god like this is the lowest of low like I, I don't I've no idea what I'm going to do with my life. Um, I had I had signed up for the row at that point, but that's not like a career, um, and I couldn't live at home forever. And what I learned at that point was I took I took time to work out what was valuable to me, and I did this amazing mm -hmm. um, exercise where you say, okay, do I want to earn really good money? Do I worry about where I live? Do I need my family near me? Do I want to be challenged? Do I want to be learning? Do I want um, does my like my environment matter? So all these different types of things, and you sort of you number them one to 10. And in that exercise, I realized that my environment was really important to me. I needed to be near the sea. That's what makes me really happy. And I needed to be challenged because I like to constantly grow, but the money was less important to me. I didn't necessarily need my family on my doorstep. And so when you learn that do these things, that's what led me to Cornwall. I was like, okay, great. Well, Cornwall, actually, there's some brilliant startups down here. There's some amazing businesses down here trying to do big things. So I could find one of those and I'll get challenged mentally through that. And I'll be near the sea. Yes, salaries are less down here, but actually that wasn't that wasn't my driver. So by taking the time out to do that in lockdown, it's led me to a life down here that I really enjoyed. If lockdown hadn't happened, maybe I would have rushed into something else. Um, I wouldn't have taken that time to do it. But that that period gave me the time to sit down and work through what was valuable to me in my life going forward. Hmm. When you've uh, achieved what you've achieved with your your rows and your records, um, I think. I think, and I might be wrong, but I think that from the outside, people who haven't necessarily hit those uh, records necessarily will look at that and think, oh, if I'd just done that, I'd, I'd be so happy. I'd be so content. But is it actually the case that once you hit the first one, you're then annoyed with yourself that it wasn't quick enough or you weren't good enough? Or when am I going to do the next one? Or, oh, my God, I can't believe so-and-so's done four and she's two years younger than me or, or does that does that go on it can go on yeah um but I think 
if I was speaking back to that person and saying, is it a miraculous fix? It's not. Um, you know, you can go and win big things. You talk to any sportsman who's won the Olympics or had an amazing rugby career and they've got, you know, they're retiring. Um, you don't just do these things and then say, great, satisfied. You know, you're constantly going to be on a learning journey yourself. Um, and I think that is, I think what I'm trying to say here is don't, you can strive to win, you can strive to be better, you can strive to get that promotion, but don't think that it's going to be a miraculous, miraculous fix for yourself. Um, understand yeah. that that's probably going to present new challenges or new things you're going to learn. So look back, back at uh, sort of uh, your past with hindsight, try and understand what lessons you've learned during that, that, that period, how you won, maybe what you could have done better. Um, because you know, even though you've won, you probably could have done something better um, and move it forward. But nothing in life is a miraculous fix. It's a constant moving journey. And, and do, do you find, though, you kind of ever have any of that kind of comparisonitis with, with others that are in a similar space? Yeah, definitely. How I, mean, do you overcome when I, I broke my world record, the Atlantic world record, and got broken a year later. And then I went and set the Pacific world record, and that got broken a year later. Neither of those records would be broken in years and years and years. I was like, what? This is so unfair. I'm going to be able to like hold my world records for a year. Um, and it is, it's really frustrating. And you do get that sort of green eyed monster of like, well, these people are now doing it. Do I have to go and now do something bigger and better because I'm like, people are at my tail trying to catch up with me. Um, and that does naturally happen. And that definitely comes into my brain. Um, but I, I acknowledge it and say, that's actually not important. Like, that the only person caring about that is you. Um, nobody else is looking at it like that. Um, and just just leave it, acknowledge it, put it on a shelf and, and leave it up there. Um, yeah, I, I would be I would be lying to you if I said that didn't come into my brain. <laughs> I, I, th I think that's true for most people that have succeeded, that they're then that they then end up looking in other lanes, like, you know. And yeah, but you, I think it's like... About yeah, I, I like that analogy of like looking in the other lanes, like stick to your own lane because everyone's paths are completely different. So if you start looking mm. at other people's lanes, you might op like miss what's in yours. Um, you know, there are all sorts of different opportunities that are presented to people every single day, probably, and people don't see them because they're too busy looking elsewhere. So mm. don't get distracted by what everyone else is doing. Just say, okay, what, what have I got in my path ahead of me? Because that's probably meant, meant to be in your path and it's leading you in the right direction. And um, I'm a big believer in that. I'm a big believer in fate. Um, and uh, things come into your lane for a reason. So, yeah, focus on those ones. And what from from the work you've done now, like obviously doing what you've done presents kind of speaking opportunities and coaching work and that kind of thing. With businesses or people or entrepreneurs that, that you've worked with, what would you say is like one of the most common challenges that that your experiences can help people overcome? I think the biggest challenge people find is people. <laughs> um, and actually, I listened to um, uh, a really good talk the other day by Yuri Levine, who is the co-founder of Waze, and he does a lot of work uh, with startups. And he said the biggest reason startups fail is because of the people. Um, and people are very tricky to manage. Um, and a lot of people are very hard on themselves, as we've spoken about through this podcast. And so what I have learned is a lot about um that resilience how to how to make yourself more resilient how to put, um, believe in yourself more even though there is that lack of uh, self-esteem or fear um and how to uh, manage other people and how to perform as a team um and treat treat humans as humans rather than robots so i think that's what i've learned the most i don't have a psychology degree i've never worked in hr but i have learned a hell of a lot about it um and i love sharing it with other people so i do quite a lot of talks um yeah, public speaking engagements and events where I just share some of the lessons that I've learned around people and what exercises we've done um, to drive high performing teams. Um, so yeah, it's it's the people piece. Yeah, and what what would be the, the I know you touched on some of them earlier. What would be the number one thing you can do to to build that culture or that high performing team that that actually wants to work together? Number one. I think if you're thinking of it as uh, as a team, um, I would say look at your values and the way that you want to work. Um, so what is important to you as a team um, and make sure that they're not just like written somewhere, that they are lived and breathed every single day. 
So uh, a really mm -hmm. good example of that is in the Pacific, we had um, the values of we wanted to get across the ocean, like healthily, no broken bones. We wanted to then make it across as better friends than when we started. And our third value was to break the world record. And it was really important that they, they were in that order because there's no point getting the world record if we'd broken a, um, broken a bone or we weren't as better, you know, we weren't good friends and we hated the memories from it. So that yeah. then came into play at sea where we had one day and we were, we were rowing really slowly. Like it was like 0.2 knots, which is basically 0.2 miles of an hour. You know, it was painful and our bodies were breaking yeah. down yeah. and we were starting to get a bit short with each other, not very nice to each other. And so we said, Do you know what, let's, let's stop, let's stop rowing. It will be at the detriment of a world record possibly, but this isn't worth it because we're, we're arguing and we're, when we're, when we're in pain. And so we, uh, we stopped, we recuperated, we actually had ended up having a bit, a bit of a giggle. Uh, we cleaned the boat and actually about a couple of hours later, we got back on the oars and we were able to, to be much stronger and we were picked up our speed because of it. Um, and because of that, we actually then still went on to break the world record. So I think it was important that we had those values to help us make those decisions in those really tough times. And having those values there actually meant that we went and, and achieved success. So I say that with every team that you're doing now, whether you're in startup, whether it's a community thing, whether it's even your, you know, your family in a way, like what, what are the values that are really important to you as people and as a team um, and make sure that you live and breathe them. That's great advice. And, and what about then for an individual? Who's, who's on their own path, they're not necessarily part of a team. Mm. How would that differ? I think for an individual, um, and we've mentioned it quite a lot, but don't, don't put that pressure on yourself to be perfect. Realise that life is a big journey. Be open to opportunities. Understand that uh, there's growth in everything. Um, so you're constantly changing. That mean, it might mean your opinions might change. It might mean that something you said a year ago is not true now. Um, that's okay. You know, you don't have to hold yourself to what something you said a year ago. So yeah, understand that life is a journey. It's an opportunity to grow um, and don't, don't be hard on yourself to be perfect. Yeah, no, that's great advice. You know, just, just as we kind of start to wrap up in the, you know, I, I think this actual conversation is, is pretty evergreen. You know, you could, you could have listened to this three years ago or in 10 years time. And I think the advice will still stand true, but certainly Whilst at time of recording, there's a cost of living crisis in the UK uh, and lots of other parts of the world. There's uh, an impending mortgage crisis for uh, many people around the UK and, a, a, you know, that's going to seriously affect people's lifestyles. Um, and there's going to be challenges. There's going to be people that actually will then feel very, they'll be trapped because they're in their mortgage and they've got their job and they've got their children, they've got their family. And maybe they've got their dreams as well, whether they're entrepreneurial or sport or whatever else it might be. What kind of advice would you give to people who are in that situation, who feel lost, who feel trapped, who feel like there isn't a way forward um, yeah. to, to, to kind of manoeuvre forwards, irrespective? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. I feel like everyone's got their own ocean to cross this year with everything that's being you know, thrown at them and the, and the way that the economy is. Um, and I think the two bits of advice are control the controllables, look at what you can control because what you can't control, it's not worth worrying about. Um, and I know that's very easy to say and much harder to put into practice, but when you do focus on the things you can control, it does help you, um, it does help you just uh, sort of focus on those things instead. And I think the second thing is just to, to, to reach out and ask for help and understand that vulnerability is okay. Um, I, I think that was the biggest difference between my mm. two oceans was the Atlantic. I didn't show much vulnerability and it bottled up and it sort of exploded and I didn't show my best self. Whereas the Pacific, I allowed myself to be vulnerable. I allowed myself to cry. I allowed myself to share my emotions with my teammates. And therefore, not only were they able to support me through those times, but actually I was a better teammate for them too, because I was able to process my emotions, move on and be more positive at the end of it. So I think that the biggest lesson is in your day-to-day -day life, Everyone's going to be struggling this year. There's a lot of things that are going to be help, like really um, affecting people's mental health. Share it, share the load, reach out. There's communities out there to help. Um, and, and that vulnerability is okay. And so uh, you have another world record in you, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, well, and... well yeah, let's not talk too soon, but hopefully, yeah. And, and so what will, you do, what will you be doing to kind of prepare mentally for that? Yep, so we've got a new team. Um, 
uh, P, who I rode across the Pacific with, she's in this team as well. And then we've got two new girls. Um, we're all leaders in our own right, actually. They've all uh, sort of led teams themselves. So uh, we're doing a lot of work around understanding how can you have a team of four leaders and how does that dynamic work? So um, that's really exciting. And, and so we've got some, uh, some exercises we're going to be going through in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're also doing uh, something called crisis planning. So uh, we come up with lots of crisis scenarios that could happen at sea. Um, and then we start planning them. But you kind of you do it individually. So um, you'll say what your answer to that crisis is. And then you bring it together. And by doing that, you understand different personalities and how different people react in crises. Um, and then we all put our answers together to essentially come up with the perfect answer that we've all come up with. So it's crisis planning. Um, and then I think the other thing I'm trying to do personally on a personal front is not burn out. I'm very good at, um, again, that like pushing myself and taking on too much is recognizing the, the, uh, the telltale signs of me about to have a meltdown and uh, giving myself that break that I talked about earlier and saying, okay, do you know what today, if that project isn't delivered or if that person doesn't get that piece of work, they're, they're going to survive. They're probably going to understand, take a minute, go, you know, go walk the dog, um, go to the beach, whatever that is. But, um, trying to recognize personally when I'm, I'm close to breakdown and, and, and trying to stop it. Is the one question, is the one thing that you thought I might have asked that I didn't, but you've got a great story or answer for? I don't think so. It's been a really interesting conversation because most people that I speak to get really into like wanting to know the real stories of, of what happened at sea and how it even sort of how you function on a rowing boat. But this has been a much more almost like philosophical conversation of um, thoughts and practices and, and a lot more relatable to actually day-to-day uh, -day life rather than really, really focusing on the sea. And I've really, really enjoyed that. So, yeah, thanks for the, the different questions. Great. Well, listen, Bella, it's been fascinating insight. And as you say, quite kind of philosophical and, and, and uh, hopefully helping people understand a bit more about the mental strength and endurance that you've learned that they can learn from. Uh, as everybody takes on their own uh, journeys right now. So thank you ever so much for joining us. No, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to The Resilience Project. Make sure you're subscribed for notifications with your favourite podcast platform so you find out first when the next one is released. For other news and updates, you can register with me directly at weslinden.com forward slash podcast. <laughs>